Good morning and welcome to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at UC Berkeley. I am Ali at Berkeley's uh, director. My name is Susan Hoffman. Today, we have the third talk in a series of four on the impact of climate change. And today's talk is called Understanding Wildfire and Its Impact in California. We have Dr. John Battles with us, who is the Professor of Forest Ecology at UC Berkeley. He's a field scientist engaged in long-term research of temperate forest ecosystems. His goal is to understand how and why forests change. Toward this end, his research seeks to understand the dynamic response of forest communities to disturbances and perturbations. And so, um, John will again talk to us today about the impact of climate change on forests. If you would please I uh, add your questions into the chat. Uh, Dr. Battles will speak for 40, 45 minutes and then take our questions afterwards. Thank you for being here. And Dr. Battles. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction, Susan. Just let me, um, does everybody see my slides? Okay, that entry slide. Good. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so, you know, I appreciate the invitation to, to speak to you today, and this is a series about climate change, and certainly in the American West and, and in, in a fair, you know, large parts of the globe, the impact of climate change on wildfire is really one of the sort of the most urgent and sort of the precursor to the kind of changes we can see. And so it's, it's one of many, th you know, threats we face from climate change, but in some ways, because of the tight link between climate and, and wildfire, I would say it's it's sort of a, it's an indicator, sort of the canary in the coal mine that we're seeing. And it raises lots of questions and problems that I'll, I'm gonna try and go through today. And I'll focus on sort of the California context, which are giving me for being provincial, but if you're gonna be provincial, California is a big place. So it's still pretty, it's still pretty representative of what's going on in other sites in the world. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm, a, I'm not a wildfire scientist, I'm a forest ecologist, and therefore I spend my time um, thinking about forests, and I just want to point out that you know forests have always been sort of a, a big part of human existence. Um, you know, they from the very beginning they've been a valued resource. Um, you know, for construction, for protection, for the products they serve. You know, for the for the habitats they they, they support. Um, this has been true uh, from the very beginning of human time. And this picture down here in the lower box. Bottom here is is where I had my, you know, this it's in Gilgamesh, you know, the first written recorded human history before Gil Gilgamesh went on to his greater heights. Is sort of his first success, if you will, was was going and and defeating Hanababa, who was the protector of the Lebanon cedars, which is this beautiful wooded lands at the heart of human civilization. And in in and in the legend of Gilgamesh, he defeats him, he kills him, um, and then takes those forest resources and you know converts them to swords and spears to further his his, um, his, his aggression and, and ambition. Um, so you go from Gilgamesh to the Paris, Peace, the Paris Accords, the Climate Accords that are our current sort of best hope for, for reducing climate change and forests also play a key role there. So they, they've always been part of our uh, a valued resource. Um, and uh, I think the scary switch is that to some, to some, you know, to, in some respects, forests are now also a bit of a threat to, to humans and the fact that they carry wildfire into communities and they have a big impact um, on, on both the ecology, but also on our society. As I mentioned, California really has been, as part of our DNA, that we are a leader in environmental protection. Um, we are a leader in the United States and we are a leader globally. You know, we're a big enough state where we can make these kind of, of, of efforts and we can fund these kind of efforts, but there's just a, a, an extraordinary amount of, of effort put into California to, to protect our environment. We have, you know, we, we have sensitive species like the spotted owl and the Pacific fisher, better protection, we protect you know, large parts of our waterways to try and preserve this, the, the Pacific salmon. And of course we have every grove of the endemic giant sequoia in California is under protection, meaning um, you know, there's restrictions on what you can do there. And then we have more broadly in this photo here, you can see all of the, um, you can see all of the lands that are, are, are set aside largely for our wild heritage. So you know, we're, we're a leader in it and we've been trying to do it and, and we are proud of it. Um, but the problem is, is that our approach, despite all our best efforts, are, are insufficient. Uh, they're insufficient to the, to the threats that are coming from climate change. And you know, we've always had fires in California. We've always had droughts. But what we're seeing now are these mega fires and these hot droughts. These are novel conditions. 
um, that, that our ecosystems have not adapted to, that our society, honestly, have not adapted to. And so they, they pose really grave threats. You know, this, people have seen this, this is from the New York Times. This is only to 2020. Um, it just shows <clears throat> wildfire trends in the American West um, since 1950 to now. And you can see this big red line is the five year rolling average of the fires. And you can just see the amount of area burned every year just has steadily, 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 steadily increases. You know, and then 2020 was off the chart up here. Um, so this is a trend for the American West that's replicated in California. Um, 2021 so far, despite the very large fires, is not close to the 2020 year. Thankfully, this atmospheric river coming in um, right now into California is going to shut down the fire season for the Sierras and the North Coast. You know, our neighbors in Southern California are still vulnerable. So we don't know what the final tally is this year yet. Um, but, you know, we've already had three, you know, we already had three bad fires. And of course, there's this human cost <clears throat> to wildfire. There's both this local cost um, in terms of communities being threatened. Here's a, a, a home being burned during the Creek Fire. And of course, these, these, these emissions have, have more regional, even, even in some ways, continental costs. Um, this is a picture of, you know, last, last fall when the East Bay was in sort of this red fog of, of wildfire particulates. And it's not only in the East Bay, but this then get translated out to West, you know, out East. And we've, there's actually good evidence that suggests that air quality in the American West over the last five years has actually gone down um, despite all the Clean Air Act and the, and the good progress made there because of wildfire particulates. Um, yeah, part of the challenge also we have is, you know, is, these, is, is the hot drought that we had in 2012 and 2015. Again, as I said, droughts have been part of uh, California's, you know, um, climate for, for, for millennia. Um, here, here is an example um, from 18, 1985 to 2015, where these, uh, the, the red line right here is air temperature, average air temperature, and the gray bars are precipitation. So we had this drought here in the 1990s. Um, we didn't have much rain, but it also was cool. And that's what we saw in the past. We kind of had what these, these ideas where there was, wasn't, wasn't a lot of rain, but it wasn't really hot. And what, what made sort of a hot drought is this 2012 to 2015, which was a record-breaking drought, we've never seen anything like it in California for the last 5,000 years, is that not only was it really dry, but it was also really hot. And that combination of, 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 of lack of precipitation and, and warm weather really stresses trees to maintain their water balance. And so, and also obviously it, it, it dries out the environment even more, making them you know, more susceptible to fire. Again, you know, as I said, we're, we're, we're record-breaking recently. This is a, a common metric common graph that shows the 20 largest fires in California. Um, you know, 2020 had, had you know, the, the biggest fires and also, you know, seven up, six of the biggest fires. The three fires we've had this year already, the Caldor fire, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Monument fire, and then the Dixie fire, we'll, we'll, we'll kick these three off. The Dixie fire is almost one of the largest. It's close to the August complex, almost a million acres. The Caldor and the Monument fire are just, you know, small fires, you know, in the 200 to 300 acre level. So we'll, so we'll have seen all of the largest fires in the last 20 years in California. Again, another problem with we just these, that's what we mean by these mega fires. Like, you know, the Rim fire, which is what I remember in 2016 or um, was, was a huge fire, uh, 2013 was, you know, it was like a 250,000 acre fire. And that was a big fire at the time. And then just, you know, eight years later, we're getting million acres. You know, it's just, it's kind of the scale. It's just kind of hard to comprehend. Um, and again, just to point out for, 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 for uh, reference, the August complex, which is the largest fire in California history, is, this, is comparable to the size of Glacier National Park. So it's like, just think of, you know, in California, that's uh, uh, a reserve land, like, you know, famous park, that entire park burned. I mean, it's a comparable area. Um, and of course, this hot drought, independent of the fire, had huge consequences for California. This is a nice um, graph from Salo Science. Um, showing you, you know, the red is where the forested area is in California. These are the forests. The orange is the fires overlaying the forested area. You can see, you know, we have a lot of fires in Southern California that are not, that are not in forests that are in the chaparral shrublands. Um, and then you see this, this red, this green here, which is pest and, and, and drought related mortality. And you see this huge concentration in the Southern Sierra. And our estimate was that, you know, between 2012 and 2016, almost 150 million trees died. Um, and you'd see scenes like this. This is actually from my research site in Yosemite National Park. Um, after the drought, which we were sampling, you can just see there's lots of trees here that have died of water stress. Um, and you know, and there's this comment here about you know, small, short growth, you know, a lot of death, small growth. Um, there's some real problems, uh, independent of of the fire risk. Um, 
you know, what we've seen now, and I think this the recent uh, recent experience in the sequoia groves has brought this out. You know, are we protecting you know you know the forest um, with our with our efforts, both our preservation efforts and our, our fire policy efforts? Um, and this was actually from 2016 from the Rough Fire, where they were again worried about these ancient sequoias um, and then sort of the name sequoias in the park um, uh, burning up. And so they would, you know, they posted wildfire, had hand crews there. You can see the, the pot, you can see the, the fire lines, you're getting ready to try and suppress it. Um, but then in 2020, we had um, the creek, we had the castle fire that ran through parts of the park um, and it burned extremely hot, extraordinarily hot in the giant sequoia groves. And so you had scenes like this. So this is a, a, a drone perspective of a giant, of a giant sequoia stand. Um, and this huge, this tree here that looks like is the biggest thing is a giant sequoia tree, and these small little trees are all these other big trees. But we were actually killing what we call the monarch giant sequoias. These are trees are the biggest trees in the forest, and have survived literally thousands of years of fire in California, and they finally have succumbed. And this is sort of an up close perspective of what one of these monarch trees looks like. You know, it's just it's so high, even though it's adapted to withstand fire. The the fire is outside the bounds of what I've seen before in its 2000 year life history and it dies. And so this is one of the real real problems that's going on. And um, you know, we've just had this, the KMP complex, I mean, the, um, the, yeah, the KMP complex fire that also was burning through the groves and this was very worrisome. It just, just went out um, you know, this, with this last rain and we took extraordinary measures. This is the General Sherman tree and they did this to a bunch of the name trees. They wrapped them in sort of protected blankets, fire protected blankets. And here's the General Grant tr tree where they're actually watering it in the midst of the fire. Um, but still, the, the fire ended up not getting into the into the giant grove. Um, but you know, the scenes like this, this is a good perspective, an evening perspective on the KMP. It's burning through a giant sequoia stand. These are all really big trees. These are these are what you consider big trees, except for the fact that they're dwarfed by this huge giant sequoia here. So I mean, it's it's we, you know, there was a my colleague Christy Brigham, who's the head of chief of resources for Giant Sequoia Kings Canyon. Just you could just see her frustration in some of her media. Um, relations there, she just really felt like she could not protect these forests no matter what she did. Um, and and then because it's a, a problem beyond her ver, pet, her venue, that, that it's really a, a much larger issue that we're facing. And so we cannot, even though we've put them in these great protections in terms of what we can do in the land, because the threats are coming from climate, from, you know, from our hundred years of, of practice, it's, it raises a problem that we can't protect the forest. Um, and the problem is, the challenge is it's gonna get worse. Um, this is a projection of climate warming in California. Again, climate, you know, California has invested a huge amount of, of research in understanding its, its trend in climate. And we've known since the first climate um, assessment that climate is warming, it's going to continue to warm, it's going to be large parts of the state. Now, precipitation is a different matter in California. It's, a, it's kind of, a, it's harder to predict and, and more variable, but boy, the, the predictions of a warming climate have been consistent from day one, and we have observed the reality of the warming climate. So we've seen it, you know, we've literally seen it. And so it's no longer a doubt. It's no longer like, is this happening? Is this going to happen? It is happening. Um, and the only question now is, is how bad is it going to happen? Are we going to have this red line? Um, or are we going to have this blue line or something worse or something perhaps even better? Um, and, and what I said is what the challenge is, is that not only do we have a warming climate, but we have all these dead trees out there. And this, this potentially creates a, a, a new kind of fire. The typical fire, the one that we really worry about is when you know, there's not a lot of, this, of, the, of fuels on the ground. There's flashy fuels, fuels that burn very quickly. But what really drives the fire, drives the heat of the fire is when the fire gets up into the crowns of the trees and the trees, the live trees provide the fuel. We call it like a flaming front. These are the things you see on the news where the fire is moving rapidly and the embers are spreading and it's killing everything in its wake. Um, that's true. And those are really dangerous fires. But what we're worried about now, in addition to that sort of flaming front, is that we have all of this these dead trees on the ground, a lot of them, most of them did not get removed from the forest. And so you have these huge sort of accumulations of, of wood on the ground and they can smolder this is, this is sort of these ground fires for, for a long time, creating a, a just intense heat in localized areas It's just sit there. And so you have, you know, this, these are all these dead tree, down trees. It looks like a fire, you know, like a, like a bonfire. This is in the woods. Um, this is just these trees that have fallen down and are burning. And they can maintain these smoldering fires and we just worry that, you know, here's a projection in Sequoia Kings Canyon that we're gonna have these elevated levels of these ground fuels that, it can, that can maintain these smoldering fires. These smoldering fires can get so hot that they create their own weather. 
Um, and they can go from smoldering to flaming and smoldering to flaming, depending on small fluctuations in, in, in the air pattern. And so it presents this huge risks to the forest um, in, in terms of the potential. You, know, you get this kind of fire near the base of a tree and it just, it just, kills, the, it just kills the tree. Um, this, is, and this is Danny Foster. He's a grad student at Berkeley who part of his dissertation is to understand you know, what the role of these fires is. He's trying to figure out what the role of, this, of these fuel loads, these brand new novel fuel loads where there's lots and lots of wood on the ground, what that means for fire behavior. You know, as we think about this, like, you know, how did we get here? And clearly climate change is part of it, but it's also partly, you know, our own choices uh, as a society to, to suppress fires. Um, and, and this hasn't always been society's choice. Um, you know, when indigenous peoples um, were in charge of stewardship in California, they had a very different perspective. And so I, I kind of want to just quickly, you know, what, what has been the pattern, you know, what has worked in these forests as we look backwards. And so I'm gonna go up to a place here, right up in, in, the, in the Six Rivers National Forest, that's right here up on the, on the Oregon, California um, border. And we're gonna use paleo, some, paleo, some paleoecology based on pollen cores in these two small lakes that, you know, um, uh, Agarabtok and Fish Lake um, in the Klamath. And we've done these pollen cores and we're gonna try and reconstruct what the forest looked like, you know, for the last couple thousand years. Um, and here's what they look like now, which is pretty typical. Um, you know, lots of trees. Um, it's a very productive landscape if you take away fire. So, you know, fire has been suppressed there for the last hundred years. Um, and again, just the history here is that, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, um, the history of, of indigenous tribes in California is, is a tragic one, um, you know, with rounds of European uh, genocide and colonization. You know, the, the Spanish were first with the missionization along the coast. They handed it off to the Mexican rancheros, um, but places in the interior and the North Coast, like the Klamath, you know, the tribes there were really less un unmolested for the most part because they just didn't have valuable resources that anybody wanted to take. And aside from some trappers and hunter type, in, you know, there was no settlements um, and very little. You know, they still managed these lands, um, uh, you know, to their own to their own values until 1849, which was the gold rush, and then very quickly up in the Klamath. Um, it changed very quickly. You went from where there was no European presence to this is a fort to our, it was this from 1857. So within eight years, there was a fort there um, in Indian territory. And of course it was driven by the desire um, for gold um, in the miners. So we replaced you know, really the indigenous stewardship um, with this, this mining period, this expansion mining period. And then you can imagine the miners weren't particularly concerned about um, the uh, long-term health and you know, of the landscape. They were there for one thing, you know, for the gold. So this is a, a recreation. This is from Clark, Clark Knight's dissertation work. And she used pollen cores and other methods to go and recreate with the biomass, how much wood was there on the forest. And she could look back in time, you know, for, for thousands of years. So this starts in 1050 BC and goes to, you know, basically 2018. Um, you know, and this is a period when there was, the vegetation was relatively stable. We didn't have large climate fluctuations. We were switching from conifer to hardwood dominated. It was still a, a conifer forest with some oak component. And that oak, that component, you know, species would switch around a little bit depending on climate patterns. This goes through the little ice age and the medieval warming. Um, well, it, we have a pretty stable vegetation that was just kind of shifts within a, within a range. Um, and what she, what we saw is that, so this is, you know, but this is predicted of above ground biomass, how much, you know, biomass is in the woods is a measure of, of how big the woods are, you know, and it's fluctuated, you know, from a hundred to, you know, we had this peak here, 200, but, you know, that was the one peak, but by and large it's fluctuated around 100 you know, megagrams per hectare until very recently. And then, you know, with, with the human colony, with European colonization um, and, and the indigenous genocide, we took over the controls and we, you know, we put in a, a no burn policy, a fire suppression, we wanted to protect the timber. And so you can see that, you know, one, you know, one aspect of that is that we've had a huge increase in the amount of biomass in the forest. And here's a picture of it. This is what like, a, you know, for those of you who don't go out in the woods, this is what a, a forest up in Six Rivers looks like if it's about, you know, 100, 110 megagrams per hectare. And here's something that looks like something close to, you know, 300 megagrams per hectare, just a lot more tree. It doesn't look bad in some ways, it's just a lot more trees in there, a lot denser, um, both small trees and, and, and large trees. Um, you know, and, and we also, you know, this just documents, you know, uh, the fire history here is that you know, we're looking at tree rings, you know, the trees that survive a fire, put a, put a wound on and then they scar over it. And so we can see age since the scars, and these are a whole bunch of trees. Each one of these lines is an individual tree that we are looking to see where the fire scars occurred in the landscape. And again, these are even you know, all the trees up here are pretty long lived. They live to be two to three hundred years old. 
Um, not every, not all of them approach the giant sequoia three millennia, but they do live hundreds of years. And so they record the occurrence of trees. And this is sort of individual trees that we aggregate to see how frequently there was fire. And you can see throughout the 16, 1700s and 1800s where our record's really strong, it was really frequent fire. It burned every five, you know, every 10 to 15 years, there was a fire in the landscape. And then of course, in 1910, we, we had a federal policy, a national policy of fire suppression. The Forest Service was well entrenched in California. And we virtually have had no fire in this area since then. So we've had this 100 year gap and that's led to this sort of increase in, in biomass. And so here's kind of a, the last couple of 300 years there. It's just the same graph, just zooming in. Um, you know, back in 1675, this was under indigenous stewardship. Again, you can see this just because of indigenous practices, cultural burning, prescribed fires that they use for a whole bunch of purposes. They maintain their landscape. And then 1850, we had the gold rush invasion. Um, there's this transition period. You know, again, the tribes are still there, but the miners are expanding. Um, we stopped fire suppression in 1910. Um, in 1950, we created uh, the Six Rivers National Forest. It kind of brought in an era of, of some timber extraction, but that also stopped around 1980. For, for various purposes, you know, partly because of environmental concerns about habitat concerns about spot at all, but also it just wasn't very profitable <clears throat> to, to haul wood, to get wood way up there far away from, from ports or from, from customers. And of course, we've, the forest has been under this suppression and we've seen this huge increase in biomass. That's partly why we're having these mega fires. Not only is it warmer um, than it used to be, but we also have just a lot more fuel in the landscape so we can carry these, these catastrophic fires. And so we see for a lot of forests like this. Um, again, at one level, it doesn't look like it's particularly unhealthy forest. This is in the Tahoe National Forest. Um, this is a pretty, but you can see that there's just a lot of trees. Um, you know, they're, they're closely connected. If a fire gets started here, it can go up from the ground into these canopies. Lots of fires to burn, not a lot of space between them. Um, and this really is something that, that, that I think has been brought up is that there's a current, there's a, there's a big push from a small, a couple of environmental groups who have scientists um, as part of them that are arguing that thinning the forest, these fuel treatments to reduce fires actually have the, the opposite effect and make fires worse. Um, to put it bluntly, I think that is complete false, completely false, um, and it does not follow the best available science. Um, the, the huge weight of evidence is in the opposite direction. I've, if you want, I don't want to go into that, but I've provided um, Susan a, a link to a recent Sacramento Bee article that really lays out what I would say is the argument of the vast majority of the scientists who are working on this. You know, fuel treatments in these kind of forests do work. They don't stop the fire, but they certainly reduce its impact. Um, so, what do we need to do? So, you know, so we, the problem is pretty clear. You know, what do we need to do? What, what, what is, you know, what, what was my recommendations for going forward? We, we definitely need to return fire. To this ecosystem, and I think that's a widely accepted. You know, that we just need to get more fire on this ecosystem. Um, this is a picture from the Blodgett Research Forest up in up in um, Georgetown, California. Um, we have a you know part of our training there, and part of our own management practices, and part of our training and research is about prescribed fires. So we do a lot of prescribed fire up there. Uh, we we do train, and we also train a lot of, of burn bosses to come through there. And this is an example. This is Ariel Rupton, who is our current forest manager, and she's training Varya, who is an undergraduate student and now an intern at the forest, you know, figuring out how to do these prescribed fires. And so we take that hands-on approach where we're trying to train the next generation. Um, and this is Jen, uh, Jennifer York, who's also, again, an experienced fire boss who's there part of the training. Um, and I would just say, I, you know, we also need to get, um, you know, as many people as possible into it. And so um, this, 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 this emergence, and this is a typical prescribed fire, you know, where we're trying to put fire on the landscape. It, it just, it removes the, it removes sort of a lot of the, the, the fuels there without harming the canopy trees too much. Of course, we also have to learn and collaborate with, with our indigenous colleagues. Um, you know, they have been doing this for millennia. They, it was part of their, part of their culture, part of their heritage. Um, and they burn for two, you know, they burn for multiple reasons. Um, they, they burn both for, for cultural burning, which, which, you know, Again, reduces fire risk, um, helps you know, maintain the ecosystem. You know, one of the key things about these these forests, not only have they increased in their biomass over time, but in the Sierra Nevada and other other conifer dominated, we've we've eliminated or reduced the amount of oak trees, which are again a traditional um, food source um, for the for indigenous tribes. And so we've reduced those those oak harvests because they tend to like more open areas, and so you don't have them. You know, and so we um, we need both of them. You know, and this also not only are we doing the burning, but we need the planting 
that comes afterwards, you know, where some of these plants are, are reestablished into the into the landscape to again to to, to, re, to restore and and to recreate what we think was a was a stable and and, and resilient landscape. Um, we also have to innovate our forest products industry. Do they play a big role? Um, you know, this the, the fuel treatments are extraordinarily expensive. Um, as I said, these the wood products are a valuable resource, and we have in some ways too many of them in the woods. But we don't have enough markets. We don't have the right markets. To, to really do that. So we need to really innovate the, the forest products industry. In particular, you know, there's always been a, a premium on the large trees because you can get dimensional lumber and you get big pieces of structural lumber, which is the which is the most valuable pieces of wood out of the out of the landscape. But we need to figure out how we deal with this, you know, make a market for these smaller trees, these smaller diameter trees. And so innovations and in, and in, in engineered wood, you know, cross laminated and, and engineered wood products that we could rather than relying on Big pieces of wood, we can put a bunch of smaller pieces of wood together. We also need to think about, you know, is there a potential fuel source here? Could we use this wood biomass to create liquid fuels as well as biomass plants? So there really needs to be innovation. This has the, the other sort of beneficial impact of, 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 of you know, rural economic development. These could be good um, sort of career building jobs that don't involve firefighting, which is a, one of the big courses of, you know, one, a, a lot of our firefighters come from rural communities. And, and that is a, a, a career, a good career, but it's also a dangerous career. You really don't want to have more firefighters um, risking their lives and breathing smoke. It'd be much better to be in a, a, a forest product industry that has a, a career path. So good jobs, um, valuable products that, that also do well for the environment. So we need to innovate the forest product industry, no doubt about it. Um, we also need to understand recovery from catastrophic fire because regardless of our best efforts, we have been getting these catastrophic fires and we will continue to get them. So we need to understand, okay, when these happen, how do we recover from them? How do we prevent the, the worst possible outcomes from these fires? This is an extraordinarily scientifically challenging and also um, from a policy perspective, it's, it's usually challenging while there's, while there's um, you know, well, I think the, the scientific evidence for, for the value of thinning to reduce fire, you know, fuel hazard treatments are valuable. Uh, what happens after a fire in terms of salvaging is, is, is a more challenging ecological, more challenging scientific question. So we need to understand what's going on. This is some of Sydney Glassman's work as a professor at UC Riverside. You know, she's been studying, you know, from the rim fire, what happens when you have one of these catastrophic fires? All the trees are dead here. All of the surface fuels and forest floor are gone. Um, you know, what, what happens? You know, how do these forests recover? What are the keys to recovery? And, you know, one of the keys to recovery are these symbiotic um, uh, fungi called ectomycorrhizae fungi that also produce some of the, the precious uh, mushrooms that we like to eat and harvest from these woods. But they're crucial. These symbiotes are crucial to the successful recovery of a forest. And, and Sydney, Glass, Sydney is working on that, which she's really some good insights. And in particular, she it's 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 hope that that the key symbiotes don't die in these high intensity fires, and they're there to help you know the, the new trees colonize and reestablish. Um, we also have to fill in <clears throat> gaps in, in our in our knowledge. Um, a, one consequence is coming from a lot of these fires and, and losses of forest is that we're having more shrublands grow into the Sierra Nevada and the North Coast. Um, this work, this here, here is some recent work from, from John Wang, who's a, PhD, a, a postdoc at, at UC Irvine, um, showing that he, using satellites <clears throat> surveys from 1985 to currently, you know, there's this huge increase in the amount of shrub land out there. Um, and this green is a decrease in, in forest land. So we're having this forest to shrub conversion going on. This hap it's not going on, it's happening in California. And it's clearly linked to the intensity, the numbers of fires. This red line here is also from John's work seeing how much area has been disturbed in California with fire. And this increase in fire perfectly correlates with this shift from shrub to forest. And the concern here again is that in these severe fires, all of the trees, um, the potential seed trees are killed. And so you shrubs always come after fire, but you get when you have no competition from the trees, you get this huge amount of shrubs coming in there. And the question is, can trees grow within these shrub fields? And so here's a classic example. This is um, um, five years post-fire in sort of central, Cal central Sierra Nevada. You can see here's a ponderosa pine tree um, sticking up that's grown up above the shrub. So that one has established, but you don't see a lot of other small trees in here. And just for reference, here's, a, here's one, one of my undergrad researchers here. There's another undergrad researcher here who's measuring the shrubs, um, trying to measure small trees in the shrublands right here. Um, so this is a dense, thick, you know, sort of penetrating a shrub field. This makes it very hard to go and, and actually study this kind of work. But, but 
Dr. Tubasing, Carmen Tubasing, did her dissertation in this work, um, trying to understand how this recovery happens. You know, what what are the you know what, what determines the fate of the small tree seedlings that are stuck underneath these shrubs? Will they grow above? How how soon will they grow above? How soon will they reestablish? And you know, I've always been impressed with Carmen's determination since one of the dominant tree one of the dominant shrubs in here is is, is white thorn. So you know, trust me, my couple of days out in the woods with her trying to set these things up. Crawling through white thorn is, is no fun, but this is kind of the essential research we need to know. You know, well, what 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 governs that tree shrub transition after these severe fires? Um, we also have to improve wildfire forecasts um, for management purposes. You know, we, we've all been exposed to sort of the PSPs, which are the power safety shutoffs that to, to prevent um, you know the, the power lines, PG&E and other 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 utility companies' power lines from sparking fire because. Dead trees and high winds and power lines are a dangerous combination. These power lines, you know, and, and high winds, these power lines sway, and if they hit each other, they, they send sparks out, and these can start fires. And so they have these protective fire shutoffs under high wind, high fire danger events. But just understanding this being a forecast is a little bit better, even incrementally better, would make a huge difference in how often we have to have these and the, the refinement of these. Also, it would also, you know, and refine our, our understanding of, of fire risks. And so colleagues at this uh, pirate, you know, we have a big consortium of, of, of talent, if you will, working on this effort um, where we're bringing together scientists and engineers and, and wildfires um, and, and utility companies are all working together to share knowledge, to try and so it's a consortium of efforts to try and understand, you know, to make better wildfire, fire, wildfire forecasts and fire weather predictions and Dr. David Saad at the University of San Francisco and Janice Cohen um, from, from, um, uh, from NASA um, are working on this and making great headway. And one of the big scientific challenges is understanding wind patterns. And that's what Janice is doing. We also have to think outside uh, the forestry box. Um, you know, the, again, the industry has a, the, 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 the industry has a lot to, you know, to do in terms of its products, but also what kind of force are we gonna grow? in the future. We know that climate change is happening. Um, regardless of whether there's a fire there, it's getting warmer uh, throughout the state. And so that changes sort of the, what, what trees grow best, where, under what conditions. And so we need to think about that. And, and again, if you think about, you know, from a forest perspective, trees live a long time. Even if you're, even if you're just growing them to harvest them, it's 60 year forecast. So what are the, you know, the, 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 cli the climate and the environment is gonna be very different 60 years from now. So we need to, we need to plant trees that anticipate that, that future. And this is the kind of work that Dr. Lauren Park Fox and, and Dr. Sarah Bisming are working. They have a big study across the Sierra Nevada where they're, they're looking at what does the future look like and, and how do those trees work? And one of the sort of, we think good tree, you know, trees that might do well in a future climate is incense cedar, um, which is a component of the forest now, but it's only a, a minor component, but it seems to do well. It seems to be one of the most drought tolerant um, trees out there. It seems to do better under warmer conditions. And so we're doing these trials these, where we're looking at, you know, what does this future look like with this Sierra Nevada Adaptive Management Project? Like, we're trying, what are the trees for the future? We need to understand that. How do we plant them? How do we manage them? What species do we put out there? Those are, that's super important. So we need to think outside of, well, you know, again, you know, forestry has been a, a well-established science in California. We have good understanding of what forests have done for the last hundred years, but those don't hold anymore. So we need to think outside that box and what does the future hold? Um, you know, again, California is, is a leader in this and it continues to lead. Um, right now, California uh, in January, 2021, it, it launched this action plan, California's wildfire and forest resilience action plan. And it really was a comprehensive strategy. Um, I've been engaged with this plan. I'm, I'm sort of the co-chair of the science advisory panel. Um, we both with the, the building up to this plan and now also the task force that that's, has the job of, of trying to implement it. Um, it's, it's an ambitious plan. That, that looks at all of the, the sort of value we place in the services we get from our forest. We, this, this, this 10 pillars, is, these are all 10, these are the 10 things that, um, you know, we, the, the 10 priority sort of resources we get from, from, from our forest, you know, from economic diversity to safe fire adapted communities, to good air quality and water security, um, to sort of all the social and recreational aspects to it, to also, you know, the, the, the CO2 benefits, again, forests play a big part in, it, in us meeting our greenhouse gas goals. And so, you know, and also how do we also, how, how do we do all this? How do we conserve biodiversity and have, you know, sort of fire safe forests? How do we uh, maintain the sort of CO2, you know, sort of 
climate services we get from our force while also meeting economic goals um, and social goals. So it's so we've identified the pillars. I think again, there's wide consensus on that. These are the you could argue about one or two of them, but these really are the services or values we put to our force. But you know, and I think there's also agreement that they're under they're under threat, um, and that we need to think about it. So so how do we do that? And I think that the big problem we have, uh, the big challenge we have. There's certainly scientific challenges, but really they're more social challenges and political challenges. Like, because because the key message, the key problem is that they're trade-offs that we can't get. We can't maximize all ten of these pillars. Uh, we have to we have to make trade-offs between them um, and, and and evaluate them um, to to you know in, in, in what both society can support um, and also meets our goals. And so this is a really so this idea of trade-offs is absolutely key, um, and they're tough questions. There really are tough questions, and so I just want to kind of highlight a, a, you know, three of them, and then to wrap up, and then open it up for questions. Um, one, I think, one of the real big ones is that we need again. Partly, my job as a scientist is, is to identify the trade-offs, trying to trying to quantify them, and then allow society uh, to to make the choices. And one of the key ones is this trade-off between um, uh, wildlife protection and, and wildfire um, safety. That there's a real big trade-off between the two. Um, and again, we have these species, um, in particular, the northern spotted owl and the Pacific, the southern Pacific fisher. Um, these are um, southern Pacific fisher is as an endangered, rec a federally recognized endangered species. Um, the owl is under consideration. Um, they both depend on this old growth habitat that you see here, which means lots of big trees, uh, dense woods, high canopies. Um, this is what they need for various parts of their life cycle. In particular, they need them. For, for den sites or for nesting sites. And so they provide that kind of, 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 of vital habitat. And without that, the populations of these, of these endangered species is, 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 um, is, is declines. Um, the problem is that what is really great owl and fisher habitat is also high fire hazard. It's actually the highest fire hazard we have. And so it has that trade off where marginal owl and fisher habitat, which is the more open forest, um, fewer trees, um, you know, more open grounds is actually only marginal owl fisher habitat, but it's low fire hazard. So we have this key trade off between protecting these endangered species and, and, and fire hazard. And there's just been real dramatic um, instances, for example, you know, where, you know, the, the mega fires that come through there are, are good for no, for nothing. I mean, none of these benefits, you have a huge catastrophic fire that, that threatens the ecosystem and communities, and it also eliminates Habitat and the King Fire, for example, in, in El Dorado County, um, you know that was a place where we've been long-term studies on spotted owls, and that King Fire, high severity fire, wiped out, um, you know, sort of the entire population of owl of owl habitat, and we just saw that owls disperse and try and find other habitat. So it's not good for anybody. How do we balance that? These are really tricky balances. You know, how, how do we get that? How do we, you know, can we? How, how much risk to these endangered species can we can we um, accept? To be able to go and and protect these forests from fire. Another trade-off is, is again we have this this vulnerability to disturbance um, on one axis, and the disturbance in, in my mind are, are again fire and, and drought, and the amount of carbon we can store in our forests. This you know the the forests are, have to play a big role in our greenhouse gas reduction goals. California is a world leader in setting those goals, and they're required and they're expecting their forests. To, 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 to store this carbon, um, keep it out of the atmosphere, and, and maybe perhaps even absorb more. But there's a trade-off here. Again, it's the same kind of trade-off we saw with the wildlife, is that so these, these, these old growth forests have lots of biomass. You know, they're, they're, they're really high on the carbon storage potential. But as that carbon storage potential goes up, you also increase your vulnerability to disturbance. It's a trade-off um, between the two. Um, again, when you have lots of wood there, you have lots of resources. It can either get burned up as fuel, but it also provides, um, you know, that in this really crowded forest, it, it's susceptible to drought. So drought stress can trigger a big die off. It can also weaken trees and, and make them more susceptible to just native pests and pathogens. And so you have this high probability of disturbance, the more crowded, the higher biomass you have in your forest. So there's this, you know, so A is a high biomass forest, but it has high vulnerability disturbance. B you know, it has more carbon storage, you know, it has, it, it, it stores less carbon, but it's, it has lower vulnerability. And so we've talked about this idea of, of, you know, what is a stable amount 
of, of carbon you can store. That would be a, an area where you could, how much carbon can you store and still protect it from catastrophic losses? This KS is carbon, the stable carbon carrying capacity versus KC, which is the maximum amount this forest could store in absence of disturbance. So you have this trade-off between disturbance and carbon storage. And again, these are these are things you have to, that we as a society have to be aware of. And that's my job as a scientist, that's a scientist's job, but it's, it's, it's society's job to figure out what policies we want to Want, want to pick how do these trade-offs work. Um, another really important trade-off. So one of the major goals of California's forest action plan is to increase the pace and scale of treatments in the woods um, in, a, in, a, in a joint uh, agreement with the federal, with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, California and the U.S. Forest Service have pledged to, to um, increase treatments on the landscape to about a million acres a year by 2025. That's like a five-fold increase of what we're doing right now. Um, and so that's going to take a huge effort. And this is not a five-fold increase in timber harvesting. This is really a five-fold increase in doing the kind of work that reduces fuels. As it. So that means prescribed fire and mechanical thinning, right? Um, now, there's trade-offs between prescribed fire and mechanical thinning in terms of their efficacy, uh, you know, in the woods. There's trade-offs in terms of their costs. While, you know, prescribed fire is considered to be a much more economical, you can treat more acres for a lower lower rate than you can with mechanical treatments. Because again, as I said, there's really no market for a lot of these small diameter trees, and there's really no market for the, the fuel the fuels on the ground. Um, but there's another trade off here is that that you know there's a huge air quality smoke emissions aspect to it. So I think here when we have a, a wildfire, you know, catastrophic wildfire, nobody thinks that's the best way. That creates a huge amount of emissions that are also that are regionalized. You know, that, 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 that encompass whole regions. And in fact, as I said, can also have these downstream effects uh, continent, on a continental basis, right? So nobody thinks catastrophic wildfire is a way to go to get rid of these emissions. And so we have two options. We can do mechanical treatments, um, which are expensive, um, but they do limit emissions. There's no smoke associated with mechanical treatment. There is, you know, there is there's machines and there's the diesel exhaust, but that's way less than the amount of smoke you get from a scrap fire. So these mechanical treatments can be effective, in terms of reducing fire, reducing fuels and, and minimizing fire hazard, um, but they limit it. But you know these, you know, that you have machines in the woods. Um, prescribed fires again, super effective um, and, and cost efficient, but they do create local emissions, right? They do create local emissions. That there's going to be some fire, and, and then uh, and while we do our best to burn on days where the wind patterns bring them away from communities. Um, if we're going to increase the pace and scale, one of the big limits on the amount of prescribed fire we can put on the landscape are air quality rules that minimize the number of burn days because of concerns about public health. And so if we're going to relax those rules um, so we can get more prescribed fire out there, we have to realize it's going to create local emissions. And so we have this problem where, um, you know, nobody, want, nobody benefits from these regional emissions. But if we do prescribe fire, there's clearly a cost to the local communities. They're going to have more smoke for parts of their summer. Um, and so we have to think about not only the efficacy, you know, the ecological and economic aspects of it, we also have to bring these environmental justice aspects to it. You know, is it, is it fair and just to ask these rural mountain communities to endure more prescribed fire because we need to avoid these big regional emissions that flow into the East Bay? You know, as, a, as an East Bay resident, I have some concerns about that uh, from a fairness perspective. And, I think you know that the job is we we have to protect the forest and the communities that depend on them, and you know environmental justice. It's, it's embedded in our landmark 2006 law that this greenhouse gas reduction has to happen in an environmentally just way. That was really a landmark part of our law that we we brought that into a law. But we you know it has to be more than just um, words. It has to be actions, and that means thinking about this right now. What the environmental justice aspects are of these trade-offs. All right, so you know. Um, this is a term that uh, Governor Brown used and you've seen in other places that we need to come to terms with, with this new normal. I mean, that, that is a fact. The forests have already changed because of both past actions, 100 years of management and also climate. Um, and so we have, to, we, have to, we have to realize that the forests are not what they were before and that we can learn from the past that, is, that projecting the past forward is not gonna be okay. We have to think about, you know, um, we, have to, we have to figure out how to go forward and again, uh, some of our colleagues from the indigenous tribes have a lot of insight because they've done this before. Um, but we have to think, you know, and I said, in a lot of ways outside the box to, to protect these, these, these vital forests um, in California. And again, just to, um, I've gone through just, you know, as a, sort of a scholarship note, um, I've, this is a, I've shared this with, with Ollie 
they have this presentation. This is a link to notes um, on uh, my slides. They're itemized slide by slide. So you'll have the slideshow. Um, and, and some of the slides are from my work. And so I put the people there who've done them. You can look under the people. But I've also, this, this link here will bring you to a text document that, that if you need, if you have more information, more interest, you want to follow up, um, this will point you in the right direction. It'll show references and websites where some of this information came from. So with that, um, I'll stop and open it up for questions. Hi, uh, John, thank you very much. I, what, um, what a comprehensive look. Um, and, you know, I think many of us have been feeling so helpless and so hopeless about the wildfire situation. Um, and I think um, in what you have just uh, shown in all of this detail, and particularly I'm very interested in the pillars of, of resilience um, and trying to get that more out as a kind of key guide uh, to OLLI members. And so thank you for sharing your PowerPoint slides with us. Um, you will see in the chat, there've been numerous questions as well as, and I wanna point out to the members who are involved in, in, in this talk, a number of resources. Um, and what I'm heartened by, one of the things that has been of interest to OLLI is how to take the learning such as, as your talk today and um, pivot that to making a difference in the world. How can we turn that into an advocacy agenda? Um, you know, because we know our Ali members are activists at heart and interested in becoming involved. So one of the, um, the questions, I've got two main questions to sort of pose to you. Um, Ali had uh, two weeks ago, over a weekend, we had um, a National Science Foundation grant to talk about, um, about STEM and about moving STEM to STEM advocacy. And in that, with Ali members and undergraduates, we posed the question, the problem that was to be solved for that day was the recovery from wildfires. Interesting, interestingly enough, the um, 60, 50, 60 participants chose to look at the human impact they, and were very human centric in their solutions. So one of the things um, that I think we are grappling with is how do we begin to widen the lens so that people also think either, even further about nature and what we can do to recover, recover nature from, um, from these catastrophes. So that's just a philosophic question right. around how do we expand consciousness? The second part is really wanting to plumb further into the governor's forest management task force. Um, people have included a link. And if there's anything else that you wanna say about it, whether or not there is, um, is there good representation? How big are they? Um, are there indigenous, um, you know, representatives? And further, you know, are we learning, are we incorporating some of those in, indigenous methods? You've talked about some of them, but if you could start us off in, in the direction of some of those questions. Right, well, I think that from a philosophical perspective, that's a good place to start. Um, and I must admit, I, I came from, you know, from, my training and, and really my my found my philosophical foundation came from letting nature take its course. Um, you know, I started my research. I, I you know I kind of wished I could just study wilderness. I didn't have to have humans involved in it, um, and and and, and they just complicate the ecology of it. But as, and through the course of my career, though, I realized that you know particularly um, you know in California, for example. Yeah, and that's one of the arguments, like, why do we need to be treating these forests? Why are we getting in there? Because why don't we just let nature take its course? Well, that is a false premise, particularly for California. We know that there's been indigenous stewardship for 10,000 years. So maybe before that, there was nature, but nature has not taken its course in California for 10,000 years. Um, we never, as a society, this society, or the indigenous communities, or the Mexican, or the Spaniards, everybody who's been in California has stewarded the landscape. And, and so what we're seeing as sort of this ideal of, of you know, for pre-European is, is, is an indigenous, is indigenous stewardship and it's 10,000 years of it. So, you know, we don't know what nature looks like 
within California without a strong human presence in this current era. And so that's why I think like to stay out to the argument to just stay away, that's not happening. Like we're not staying away with what we're doing to the climate. We're actually warming it. That's a human caused event. I saw in the chat, we're not staying away because we're, 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 we're building our communities into these ecosystems. So we're putting, you know, we're changing them for our development and our, our residential and expansion of our urban core. And so we have to have an active management. Doesn't mean we have to go and, you know, we can't let when the ecosystem can work on its own, but we have to, we do have to have some intervention. And so I think that's one thing. There's, there's always a call like stay away, don't intervene. And that would be great, except for that we've been intervening for so long that to stop now, um, we're gonna have consequences I think that we know that we don't want. Um, and so I, I, that's been a philosophical change throughout my career. But I, I think again, seeing the evidence, particularly looking back to see how profound the um, indigenous tribes measure in, in California in particular, um, they so actively manage their own landscape that what we think of as natural, what John Muir described as natural was not natural. It was indigenous stewardship. That's what it looked like. And if we like that, then we have to use those practices. Um, and we have to have to come to, come to that. Um, in terms of the, so that's, that's philosophical. On the other hand, so from the really nitty gritty end, um, uh, I, I think before, so I, I'm, you know, one of the great things that I think it's a really good thing about California um, is that its natural resource policy really does want to be guided by science. Now that doesn't mean science rules the day and politics and economics and social considerations don't 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 sort of make the final consideration. But at the, at the basis, the leadership of California, this has been my experience since I've been teaching at, Cal, at, UW, at UC, that they do want to know at least what the science says and then they'll make decisions based on that. And so that, that has been a bedrock part of, of California's um, sort of forest management plan, which I'm, which is good. They, again, they don't always listen to the scientists and sometimes like we've seen you make decisions that trade-offs, there are gonna be trade-offs going on here. Um, right now, so the current plan, the current forest resilience, wildfire and forest resilience plan um, we have is, is really, the goal is to be super integrated. So there is a co-leadership between the US Forest Service. So the regional forester is, is the co-chair along with the secretary of, of uh, natural resources. And then on that leadership board, they have um, that the tribes have a you know the tribe is on the, tri the tribal representation on the leadership board as well as county representation um, across the board. So we're trying to get that idea that we both need sort of the, the higher level leadership as well as um, the tribal as well as the local engagement in it. And so we're trying to do that because again, none of, none of these solutions work without buy-in. From, from the local regions. You can't do, if, if really the populace is not engaged, uh, it just won't happen. So we need to get that local buy-in. We need to, you know, we also, the, another key part of the, the action plan is that it, rep, it, it recognizes the, the ecological reality that the fire regime is different in different parts of California. So I was focused on the Sierra Nevada and sort of the forests of the North Coast, but there's also a huge fire problem in Southern California in the, in the Chaparral woodland, Chaparral and, um, chaparral lands down there. And that's a completely different story um, in terms of the fire regime, in terms of the risks. In some ways, there's too much fire um, in Southern California um, that, that's, that's coming in there. And so prescribed fire might not be such a great idea um, or might not be as effective. Um, so there's just these different challenges. And so we have to have regional solutions. And so another key part of the action plan is that the state has been divided up into regions. And the, I, the goal is to provide the resources and the information and sort of some overall guidelines, um, but let the local regions make those choices on what one of those, those pillars is most valuable. Because you can expect you know, reasonable people to have differences of opinion on how much you balance endangered species protection against wildfire protection, how much, you, you know, how much carbon storage versus wildfire protection, you know, clean water, you know, clean air versus um, you know, protecting um, recreational values. So there's all, so you want these solutions to be you know, regionally guided. So there's not one, so it doesn't come from the top from Sacramento um, telling people what to do, um, rather saying, here's our overall goals um, and here's you know, the resources and the knowledge to, to, make, to make local decisions. And so we're just rolling that out right now. Um, and again, you know, the, the science advisory panel is, is providing input for, 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 for how, to, how to organize this and trying to get the science out there, trying to get the tools out there to evaluate um, 
and, and then leaving it up to the, the policymakers. I think in some ways, these, local, these regional groups. And John, could you suggest a number of nonprofits um, for either at a state level or even our local regional level that you think yeah. would be particularly valuable for people to know about? Well, the Nature Conservancy has a is playing a big role in it. Um, and, and in fact, those 10 pillars came out of a, a Nature Conservancy collaboration with the Forest Service called the, the Central Sierra, the TCSI, the Central, Central Sierra Tahoe Initiative, where they tried to manage on a, a regional basis, um, tried to get all the resources together to take long-term planning. A key part of this is that this is not a one shot. I know that, you know, um, right now there's a huge amount of interest in it, you know, and the governor and the legislator have, a, you know, have, uh, I've allocated $1.5 billion this fiscal year to the wildfire problem. You know, the problem, the challenge is that it's not a one year problem, it's a 20 year problem. And then it's something, you know, to get a handle on is that something we have to maintain every year. It's not like we have to stop. And so, the, you know, the, the, the Nature Conservancy was really engaged in like, how do we plan, how do we set up structures that we can go and plan what happens this year, the next year? Like, we have a priority list of treatments that get you the best bang for your buck in terms of your goals. You know, wildfire, you know, reducing wildfire hazard, protecting um, water resources, um, you know, minimizing the amount of air pollution, the, the, those sort of goals. And so they were really, they, you know, they were a, a leader in that. Um, I think another, uh, you know, big, you know, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, which is not an NGO, but has been really big in helping to organize and think about how you do this kind of regional planning for the Sierra Nevada. Um, uh, and another, another really, I think, again, sort of local regional group that's very that's doing a really, really interesting work is the North Coast Resource Partnership. Um, that's a, a, a regional alliance that has at its leadership board. It has you know county representation, and because it's in the North Coast, that's in the heart of Indian Country. It also has representation from the tribes um, and and and, you know, you know, and sort of decision authority. Where I think there's five representatives from the counties and three representatives from the tribes that make decisions on the prioritization, the allocation of, of state money for the treatments that happen in the North Coast region. And so that's another um, sort of, I, I think it's a, I'm not even quite sure if it's a 5013C or I think it's an NGO that does this. And it's really an interesting model for how to come together. And, and you see and you see the differences, you know, the county, some of the counties tend to be very interested that they, they desperately need economic development. So they're focused, they see the value of economic development and where the indigenous tribes see a, a greater ability to be able to, to restore a lot of the cultural and the, and the landscape that they think is part, that is the right way, that, that, that their, their, their experience is, is, is a healthy forest. So you see that kind of, 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 of trade-off going on there. So those are three, you know, those are, you know, say the Redwood League has been fun, you know, they've really been, you know, especially with the, the loss of the giant sequoia, they've also been deeply engaged um, in, in terms of, of, I think, productively engaged. I, you know, I have, again, I, I work, I, I think that the environmental groups in California have done a lot of good. Um, and I think this, I, this, this, this um, sort of attack on fuel treatments and sort of the counter, the contrarian science is coming from a, a relatively small group, the John Muir Project um, is, is one of the main leaders of this. And they're, they're an outlier even among environmental groups. Great. I know in working in arts advocacy and higher education advocacy, we would also turn to environmental advocacy because we felt like the environmentalists um, really had some of that terrain etched out um, uh, much more kind of progressively and in, with enlightenment. You know, I love the presentation um, and showing the photographs of the scientists who are working in the field and noting um, their youthfulness. <laughs> yeah. that's, just, that's our hope. I, that, you know, that, that really is our hope. hope. <laughs> yeah. I, I hate this. I don't mean to, you know, cast aspersions, but I've cast it on myself. But our generation failed in addressing this issue. We really did. Um, and we've leaving a big problem to the next generation. And so I feel a lot of times like where I need to put my efforts is to make sure these people have all the skills they have to be able to address a problem that but we, we, we whiffed on to be honest, as a, you know, our general, you know, broadly, um, we have not, we were in the leadership role and we did not make a change right. um, that we needed to do. Well, I'm gonna ask one final question just so that we feel like there's something else we might be able to do. One of our members has fallen trees on her property. Should she remove those? 
Uh, how close are they to your house? If they're, you know, you don't, you don't, you definitely want that. You don't want them close to your house, but a big tree that's farther away, like, you know, within that hundred foot clearance is probably not a big problem. Um, but you don't want them close. You certainly don't want them close. Um, and so that, I think that's the biggest problem. So, yeah, John, thank you very, yep. very much. Um, okay. to everyone who's here listening, we, we will, I uh, send you the notice when we've been able to caption uh, John's talk, we have his PowerPoint. And so sometime next week, uh, you'll receive an email from us uh, with all of that. And look for um, the Berkeley Talks uh, podcast, which we hope will we'll develop as well. John, thank you very much yeah. for your work and thank you for your time today. Well, thank you for listening and I appreciate the invitation. Great.